you know, now that I think about it, I wonder if the music that I'm playing this week, this opening song, which is El Santo, The Masked Avenger by the Nick Adams, if I should have sat on it until next week's episode. I don't want to spoil what we're going to be talking about next week, although you may have already seen it in the show notes, but you know, I wonder, you know what? I like this song. Maybe I'll play it again next week anyway. Hi, welcome to the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. This is Monster Kid Radio, and we are in week three of Lucha de Mayo 2021, where we shift focus a little bit. Instead of looking at monster movies, we tighten our focus and we look at monster movies of Mexico with luchadors. Yeah, it is the month that we spend looking at luchador monster movies, luchador movies in general. It's just a lot of fun. I love these films so much, and I hope the enthusiasm that I and the guests have for this subject, for this topic, you know, comes across and that you're having a good time too. Like I said, this is week three, and the movie we're talking about this week is a movie that was not initially on my radar to ever cover during Lucha de Mayo. Chris McMillan, this week's guest from the Shadow for Portland, changed my mind. The movie is called The Batwoman, and it has absolutely nothing to do with DC Comics, legally. I don't know if I'm required to say that, but just stay tuned. You'll hear all about it when Chris and I sit down to catch up and talk about this film, as well as a number of other things, just because that's what happens when monster kids get to talking. We play around with the classic five, yeah, we just have a good time, and I think you guys and gals are going to dig it as well. Now, before that, before we get our Lucha on, we got to get our Ultra on. We've got Mark Madsky here with his next installment of the Beta Capsule Review. If you want to know anything about Ultraman, Mark Matsky is laying it out for us. He is laying the groundwork, putting down episode by episode what Ultraman is and did and does and just how cool it is. I think you're going to enjoy that as well. And you know what? Why don't we go ahead and run the next installment of Atomic Tales. It'll be Atomic Tales number four. The name of the story is... The UFO You Know. That's the name of the episode, that is. Excuse me. This is something that is written by Stephen E. Sullivan and produced by our friend Christopher R. Mim. So we're going to be doing that here as well. Why don't we go ahead and roll into all of that? Uh, well, right now. Today was like any other. The hum of daily activity until... Reptilicus. A beast born 50 million years out of time, spreading terror in its path, destruction in its wake, towering over the cities of the world. Reptilicus. Invincible, indestructible. Reptilicus. In color from American International. Even after you see it, you won't believe it. Reptilicus. Samson and the Vampire Women. Deep in the bowels of the earth live the most savage and vicious of all women. They capture, they drain the blood from human beings to make themselves beautiful in Samson and the Vampire Women. These two blue marks close together on the victim's neck are what have me puzzled, Inspector. Besides that, we didn't find one drop of blood in the corpse. Why, you could swear that a vampire murdered the girl. Hey, now that I think about it, I'll bet those monsters were vampires, Doc. See mighty Samson set fire to the vampire's cave in Samson and the Vampire Women. I am Dr. Lee Cushing. Welcome to my Chamber of Horrors. Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is a serialized monster rally novel in the tradition of the classic Universal and Hammer horror films. It's written by Stephen D. Sullivan, the award-winning author of White Zombie, Daikaiju Attack, Manos, The Hands of Fate, and the original chill role-playing game. My goal is to recreate the thrills of the monster vs. monster films that we all love. We'll have vampires, werewolves, mummies, psychic twins, and scheming madmen, 
and that's just in the first storyline. Now you can get Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors and other monster stories sent directly to your email for as little as a dollar a month. For just two dollars, you'll get all the chapters in advance, plus bonus stories and other perks. Sign up now at CushingHorrors.com or visit SDSullivan.com for a Patreon link. I do hope you've enjoyed your visit. Please come again. And remember, the chamber is always waiting for its next victim. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. A giant meteorite falls in the Middle East, and strange things begin to happen. Jim, a messenger from the Paris Science Special Search Party, arrives with the news that the Turkish and Indian branches sent research parties but all are missing. Paris headquarters asks the Japanese branch to move out, and they agree with Jim in tow. So begins episode seven of Ultraman, the Blue Stone of Barati. The Science Patrol VTOL heads west over the Himalayas towards their destination somewhere on the Arabian Peninsula. Before they can land, a tornadic wall of magnetic energy causes them to crash in the desert. Ide, who is injured, stays with the downed craft to fix the radio as Captain Muramatsu, Jim, Hayata, and Arashi head out to explore. Locating the meteorite, they are surprised to learn it is not the source of the magnetic ray and shocked to find out what is, a monstrous beetle named Antlar. Leaving the scene, the Science Patrol stumbles upon what appears to be a ghost town in the shadow of Mount Ararat. It is Barati, and they quickly become acquainted with the residents and their leader, Chartum, a woman with the ability to speak Japanese thanks to ESP. She recounts Antlar's reign of terror before revealing a statue of their god, Noah, resulting in the biggest bombshell moment of the series thus far. Antlar surfaces from the sand, Hayata transforms into Ultraman to defend Barati, but his spacium beam has little effect on the big bug, necessitating a bit of divine intervention. The Blue Stone of Barati is truly epic in scale, not only illustrating the worldwide network of the SSSP, but creating a mythology for ultra beings in the context of world history. As a monster design, Antlar is strikingly natural looking, relative to other Ultraman monsters at least. The large outdoor set, which adds a great deal of atmosphere, was also used for a feature film the same year, Adventure in Kaigen Castle, starring the iconic Toshiro Mifune. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Mansky reporting. Giant Monster Films, The War of the Gargantuas, and Monster Zero. See the two mighty Gargantuas battle to the death. And on the same program, Rodan and Godzilla join forces to destroy the deadly Monster Zero. The War of the Gargantuas and Monster Zero, both in color. Rated G, general audience from United Productions of America, a subsidiary of DEI Industries. From caves and sewers come the slime people. The kill, kill, kill. There is no escape from the slime people. The slime people. Nothing can stop the horror of the slime people. For a new adventure in terror, live through the wild bloodbath of the slime people. With lust they come, with vengeance and murder. See the nightmare of the slime people. SOS, San Francisco calling. Monster has attacked. It came from beneath the sea. Golden Gate Bridge ripped from towers. Rush new atomic weapons or whole west coast is doomed. See Columbia Pictures' spectacular and terrifying... It It came came from from beneath beneath the the sea. sea. 
Stephen D. Sullivan and St. Euphoria present... Atomic Tales! Stories of science, mystery, and excitement. This episode features the latest adventure in our fantastic original series, Strange Invaders. Tonight, Agents 1 and 2 of the U.S. Science Bureau investigate strange lights in the sky in The UFO You Know. Join us now as we present another in our continuing series of Atomic Tales. Duck! I dove to the ground and Agent 2 did the same, both of us quickly flattening against the leaves and dry grass just outside the Air Force Base's perimeter. The hair on the back of my neck bristled and a wave of heat washed over us as the glowing object zoomed past overhead. Hells bells! What was that? Agent 2, also known as Buster Ace Freeman, asked. Damned if I know, I replied as the two of us scrambled to our feet. The glowing disc-shaped object had angled right for us as we were getting the lay of the land. It moved too fast to get a good estimate of its size before we hit the deck. So not giant fireflies this time, Two said. Probably not. The greenish, unidentified flying object streaked over the nearby forest. Fortunately, a firebreak ran through those woods. Come on, let's see if we can catch it. Agent Two and I dashed for the Bureau Studebaker and Ace took the wheel. The starter sputtered and refused to catch. Son of a- Ace cursed, getting back out of the car. Ray, try to start it when I say. I slid across the Studebaker's bench seat to the driver's side. Ace is the best mechanic in the agency. If anyone could get this car started, it was him. He popped the hood and peered inside, his nimble hands flying over several parts of the engine, checking connections. I don't see anything. Try it again. Nothing, I frowned as the UFO vanished behind the tree line. Forget it, Ace. It's gone. He slammed the hood shut. Shoot. I guess we're hoofing it to the base, then. Suddenly, the champion's six cylinders roared to life. I slid back to the passenger side. What the? Ace took the wheel again, looking frustrated. Just like the Foo Fighters back in the war. Electronics all went crazy around them. I nodded. At least we don't have to walk to base command. Greenpoint Air Force Base looked almost deserted after we checked in at the gate. As we pulled up to the compound, a tall, middle-aged man in a captain's uniform hurried out of the base office. Two and I got out of the Studebaker to greet him. Captain Koch, I assume, I said. It's spelled Koch, but it's pronounced Cook. Captain Cook replied, shaking hands with both of us. You from the U.S. Science Bureau? Yeah, I said. I'm Agent 1 and this is Agent 2. Always nice to meet a fellow Air Force man. Two added. Cook nodded appreciatively. Tuskegee? Yep. Two affirmed. Saw some action in the Pacific, too. Glad to have you both here. Cook said. Can you believe this? He indicated the nearly empty complex surrounding us. Only a few uniformed airmen hustled between the standard military-issue buildings and a single jeep sat alone and empty by the mess hall. During wartime, we had nearly 40 officers here and over a thousand military personnel and trainees, plus civilians. Cook continued. Now, less than 100 total. Back then, we'd have been able to handle this flap ourselves, though I am grateful to have you here. Thanks, I said. We have some experience in this area. I hope so. Cook replied. We've been seeing these things for weeks now, off and on. Project Blue Book sent some boys in last week. They didn't find Diddley. Said it was swamp gas. Overeducated idiots. Was it swamp gas that set off our radar? Was it swamp gas that caused a power outage and stalled our vehicles? Not likely. Agent 2 agreed. And it wasn't swamp gas that buzzed us when we stopped to get the lay of the land, I added. You saw something? Cook asked. Our tower had a brief hit on radar, but nobody got a visual. Went northwest over the woods, I told him. Cook rubbed his stubbly chin. I judged that he was one of those guys who could shave twice a day and still have a five o'clock shadow. Yeah, that makes sense. We had a fence guard go AWOL out that way last night after somebody reported lights. Haven't been able to turn him up since. Those woods beyond the fence have gotten pretty thick since the war. Mind if we give the whole shebang another look? I asked. Cook smiled. Knock yourselves out. I barely have enough personnel to fill a bucket, never mind chasing down every gold brick out pitching woo to some local girl. This base is shutting down, you know. Everything's moving to Wright-Patterson. Ever asked decided this isn't a good site to convert to nuclear defense? Two asked. 
Cook's eyes narrowed. That's supposed to be classified. We both got top clearance, I assured him. I believe the Bureau mentioned that when we said we'd be dropping by. Slipped my mind. He admitted. The Science Bureau. There's an agency for everything nowadays. I'll be a science fiction bureau next thing you know. He sighed before continuing. You guys look around as much as you need. Let me know if you'd find more than those blue book jokers did. And if you turn up that gold bricking Corporal Kaiser, take him to the MPs. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Sure thing, I said. You mind if we borrow one of your jeeps? I'm not sure our Studebaker can handle some of the terrain around the perimeter. No problem, Cook replied. Come on in the office and get the keys. You guys want a great knee high or something? Forty-five minutes later, Agent Two and I had maneuvered the jeep into the forest outside the base perimeter, near where we last saw the UFO. But we'd already reached a patch where even the jeep couldn't squeeze between the trees. Admit it, Two said as he hopped out. You requisitioned this jeep just so you wouldn't wreck another car. I groaned. Well, I never lived that down. Not so long as their mouths at the bureau tell the tale, he replied with a laugh. Well, this jeep isn't wrecked yet. I checked my compass. I think the UFO kept going northwest from here. Ace frowned. Your compass must be busted. Check the sun. You're headed almost due west. You're right. Check yours. Damn. Mine's off, too. My watch has stopped. Magnetized. Which means... If we follow our compass deviations, we should hit what's causing these disturbances, I concluded. My bet's on that Foo Fighter. Yeah. Maybe. I drew my pistol and Ace did, too. Keep your eyes peeled. Together we moved into the woods, quickly but cautiously. The Midwestern summer afternoon was warm, but not too humid. We were lucky in that respect. The trees weren't huge, but the ground cover was fairly thick with ferns and bracken. The smell of wild greenery and the sounds of insects, birds, and even a frog or two filled the air. Then suddenly, it got quiet. Ace glanced at me and pointed. Check it out. Both his finger and my compass needle indicated the same direction. Ahead, a vague yellow-green glow leaked through the foliage as the late afternoon sun cast long, dark shadows through the forest. Reflected sunlight, I ventured. Two shook his head and tapped his ear with his index finger. I heard it now, too. A vague humming. Not insects. More like electricity coursing through power lines. We signaled each other to close in, both keeping our weapons drawn. He went right, I went left. The rough ground made staying silent hard, but as the shadows around us deepened, the glow resolved into the same object that had buzzed us earlier. The forest opened up, and there it sat, some weird glowing thing hovering two yards above the clearing. The intense yellow-green glow made the UFO hard to look at, but the shape was like a football or maybe a saucer. The air stank of ozone, and the hair on my arms, the back of my neck, and even crew cuts stood on end. That, plus a burst of intuition, caused me to do something an agent is never supposed to do. I dropped my gun. A beam of light streaked out of the craft and hit my weapon as it tumbled to the ground. To my right, Agent 2 opened fired, likely thinking I was under attack. The whole world vanished in a flash of brilliant light, and I suddenly found myself sitting on my keister on the forest floor. Agent 1, you okay? Ace called to me. He'd been knocked down as well. Yeah. Yeah, I replied. What happened? Did it zip into space or just vanish? He shook his head as we rose and staggered toward each other. Don't know. Could have been some kind of electrical phenomenon discharged into the ground through our weapons. I thought it was attacking. Thanks for jumping to my defense. I retrieved my pistol from the brush nearby. Weirdly, it was stone cold but melted. Useless. I holstered it anyway. All the plants in the clearing had been flattened like they'd been run over by a steamroller. A low moaning came from the forest across from us. We hurried that way and found a twenty-something soldier laying on his back near the edge of the woods. Corporal Kaiser, I presume? I said, reading the name badge on his uniform. The guy nodded and rubbed the back of his skull. Are you okay? Two asked, helping him up. Yeah. Kaiser replied. Just a crick in my neck. He peered through the trees at the sun, just hitting the horizon. Jeez, have I been out all night? Longer than that, I told him. It's sunset. You've been missing for most of a day. What happened? Kaiser shook his head. It was the UFO, you know. I was following it, and I guess it must have knocked me cold. 
He rubbed his neck again. We better get you back to the base. Two suggested. I'm sure the docks will want to look you over. Yeah, okay. Two and I supported him as we trudged back toward the jeep. Agent Two grinned at me as we went. Well, you lost a weapon this time out, Agent One, but at least you didn't wreck any cars. What could I do but laugh? (laughs) Hey, nobody's perfect. This has been an original story of Strange Invaders, part of our ongoing series of Atomic Tales. Brought to you by St. Euphoria Productions and the Monster Conservancy. Tonight's episode, The UFO You Know, was written by Stephen D. Sullivan. It was produced, edited, and read by Christopher R. Mim and featured Fred Goodrum as Agent 2, a.k.a. Ace Freeman, Derek Cook as Captain Cook, and Elliot Mim as Corporal Kaiser. Special thanks to Ron Patla for help with military research. Any errors are not his fault. Please support the films of Christopher R. Mim at SaintEuphoria.com and the work of Stephen D. Sullivan via his Patreon at PaySteve.com. All elements of this episode are copyright 2021 by their creators and may not be reproduced or reused without permission. Atomic Tales and Strange Invaders are trademarks of Stephen D. Sullivan, all rights reserved. Join the conversation at SaveMonsters.com. Famous Monsters of Hollywood magazine names it Chuck Award winner The Monster of Piedras Blancas The Monster of Piedras Blancas The world's most shocking monster Stalks its unsuspecting prey Feasts its eyes on the next victim to writhe in its slimy arms The screen's most nightmarish beast A claw-fingered, scaly-skinned, half-human crustacean, turning a lonely lighthouse village into a frenzied bedlam of blood-curdling horror. Never have you known such cringing terror, then trapped in a torment of unendurable suspense. See the movie named the most brain-paralyzing shock story of them all, The Monster of Piedras Blancas. Ponga. Not since King Kong has the screen exploded with such mighty fury. Defying bullets, bombs, rockets, standing a hundred feet tall, sending an entire civilization into panic. Conga, in color and spectimation. Preacher with the atom ray. A motion picture shot full of thrills based on scientific facts described in leading national magazines. You'll be hypnotized. You'll be terrorized. You'll be paralyzed. See a dead man come from beyond the grave. See Columbia Pictures startling... (laughs) Preacher with the Atom Ray. This is Count Vlad, but you may recognize me by my more familiar name, Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. In your parlance, you might call these revelations spoilers. You know how the children of the night Ah, I mean monster kids can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned, and don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. Ladies and gentlemen, monster kids, we are now in the dark, because we have the shadow over Portland, over Monster Kid Radio, the man who runs Shadow Over Portland, it's Chris McMillan. What's up, man? Not much. Just thankful that you... Well, thank you for inviting me back on. Do want to say that because I always love coming on this show. It's it's so much fun. I have so much fun doing it. You know what? I just had a thought. You know what? 
let's circle back to this at the very end of this conversation. I have an idea about something. But anyway, okay. how, how's, how's Shout Over Portland <laughs> going? It's going better now that we're slowly reopening. I mean, last year it was like, well, what can I write about now? Only the stuff that got uh, canceled or postponed. And there's still a lot of stuff doing that. Yeah, it's a shame, but you know, slowly, hopefully, we'll get back to normal and maybe have a convention season next year. God, I hope. <laughs> you know, we've got Halloween is in four and a half months. Oh, we have to have or, a Halloween. Or five months or whatever. No, five and a half. Five, yeah, five and a half. Mm-hmm. So, listeners, do what you can to help. Uh, you know, get us out of this whole pandemic thing because I don't want to see Halloween get canceled again this year. All right. We lost last year, and it was on a Saturday. Right? I mean, now Halloween's on a Sunday, and don't get me wrong. If if we're out of this, I'm still going to have a fine time and go to work tired the next day, but I would have so well, loved yeah. to have a Saturday Halloween. Priorities, man. I know. <laughs> Come on. Uh, so Shadow Over Portland, for people who don't know, I'm, I'm sure I've talked about it on the show before, and you've heard Chris before, shadowoverportland.blogspot.com. Head over there to find out about what's the haps in the horror world in the Pacific Northwest uh, and, and into California, into Canada sometimes. He's really got it covered. And yeah, sometimes it's a little horror adjacent, but it's all genre. It's all fun. Yeah. Check it out. And I believe there is a link in the permalinks section over at monsterkidradio.net. At least there better be uh, the amount of times I've had you on the show. Well, shoot, you were on the very first episode of MKR. You better be over there. Uh, yeah, I would hope so. I would appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know how long ago that was? Oh, man. Was it six years? It was a, many, many moons ago. Oh, sometimes it feels like. Yeah. Being in the, even a slight lockdown kind of makes things seem so much longer so we are recording this on may 16th 2021 the episode will be going out and become live on my may 20th 2021 episode number one of monster kid radio i don't count the zero episode where i was introducing it the very first episode episode number one may 27th 2013 oh man that's a lot right? of moons. <laughs> that's many, many moons ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that. I was looking at that the other day and it just, wow. It occurred to me that May was when we launched last, you know, at the very beginning. And mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. That that's, was at that's kind of nuts. What was the Bandom PDX? Uh, Wonder Northwest. Wonder Northwest. Yes. Yeah. Which it's no longer Wonder Northwest. It is now. Um, Something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the Wasabi Con. Wasabi Con. Oh, that's right. Wasabi Con. Right? Yeah, yeah. They're most. Uh, I think they've pretty much circled around to strictly games, gaming, and cosplay, and and anime stuff. But yeah, lot, lots of anime and Japanese stuff and that sort of thing. Oh so. yeah. Uh, and I, I'm on their mailing list now. I'm assuming you are too at this point. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm keep, I'm, I, and that's one of those things that go on the uh, Shadow of a Portland Horror Sci-Fi Fantasy Calendar. You know what? Let me take all of this back. It's not WasabiCon. WasabiCon is what we did last time. Wonder Northwest was a convention that is no more. It doesn't happen that's anymore. That's right. That's right. Wonder Northwest was, I mean, that was seven years ago, man. Yeah, well, and hey, we're getting old. Oh. We can be forgiven for forgetting, you know? <laughs> be forgiven, forgiven. Seven or eight, I don't know. Math is hard. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. Man, you know, I could go back in and edit all that to make it sound like we know what we're talking about, but I think I'm just going to leave it in. Well, why not? Because, uh, you know, <laughs> hey, they know we don't always know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about when it comes to the monster movies, at least. Well, that's true. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it, and there's so many cons and so many of them have changed and changed names, changed focus over the years around here. Sometimes it's, it's tough to keep a track of them all. That's true. That's true. Have you uh, heard anything about one of the big festivals we look forward to, Lovecraft? I mean, I haven't heard anything at all. I, I, you? I haven't heard anything yet. I, well, Brian and Gwen do the uh, Portland Horror Film Festival, too. Yeah. And I think, is that next month? Is it already? I think it's in June. <laughs> or is it July? <laughs> Oh, man. Welcome to the podcast where a couple of people who feel older than they really are talk about things that have nothing to do with what you came to listen to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what I think is going to happen is that will be the test. If they're going to open in the summer, that'll be the determining factor, I think. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. June is when they typically do that. You're right. So that'd be next month. Yeah. And I 
I don't, you know, I, I get the sense that that one's going to be online again. Go virtually. Yeah. yeah. You know, even though we got a lot of people getting vaccinated, we got a lot of people wearing masks, everybody's trying to get through this. I just don't know if the restrictions are going to be lifted soon enough. And also, you know, I mean, they're like, there's a theater here where I'm at that has, that could reopen, but they don't want to because they are, it's an old building like a Hollywood theater and the, and the air circulation is not exactly the best in those things. So yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Understood, man. Yeah, you're right. Cause they're not just relying on whether or not they want to do it. It's the venue has to be able to handle it. So you're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, if there's still social distancing involved in theater seats, you know, you can't have a packed theater again. So, you know, that'd be the one time that the, New, the new, well, they're not new anymore, but the remodeled seats. You've been going to the Lovecraft Film Festival for a long time. Oh, yeah. Uh, when I first started going, they had a lot more seats in there, but then they replaced all the seats and started adding tables and all that. So it really it lowered their capacity. Yeah, but it wasn't all that much. I don't, it wasn't all that much, but by putting the tables, especially the upper two houses. Oh, yeah. I guess you actually now have a little extra social distancing (laughs) buffering built in, right? That is true. That is true. But, you know, I mean, if they have to stagger people in seats on a row, so you can, instead of, let's say you have a row of 20 seats and you can only have five people in it, you know, that's going to severely hamper any ability for, you know, any sort of film festival or anything to actually do what it's supposed to do and make some money so they can do it again next year. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah. We're, we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh. <laughs> so in a really roundabout way, and I know I took us down a different tangent, but in a really roundabout way, what I was going to say was listeners, if you're in the Pacific Northwest and if you know of any events that are coming up, get a hold of Chris, head over to shadow over and let them know if you're in the area and you want to know about something that's coming up, Head over there and check it out because Chris has got the information. He's the he's the man for you. He's the broker of all this spooky boo stuff. Well, and it's also got sci fi and uh, fantasy in there. So, and, and if anybody knows a love like a small theater that's opened up in their neighborhood and they're starting to show some genre stuff, I usually don't like doing the mainstream releases because you know they have an advertising budget and all that. But right now, you know, some of these theaters that's all they can show. You know, I want to get the small theater some business if they can. So anybody has a small theater that's opened up and is showing stuff, let me know so I can go online, add them to my list, and make sure they get some publicity. And if you are one of the bigger mainstream theaters and you're doing some genre stuff, let Chris and I know because we'd be happy to take advantage of your advertising budget <laughs> to help promote what you're doing. Oh, Just yeah. saying. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about this week's movie here in a second. I know we've kind of warmed up a little bit, and you and I have been friends for a long time, so it's not like we're going to not have something to talk about, but there's something the listeners expect. Oh, yeah. we got to give them what they want. we got to give them a round of the Classic Five. The Classic Five! Chris is not one of those guests who's going to sing along, is he? <laughs> oh, oh, no, I was, I was making a pause... I was letting Steve in all his glory sing that. That's what that pause was. I figured the classic five. Oh man. Now I'm going to add you to the mix, dude. <laughs> Cause right now I've got Steve and Kenny doing it together. Oh God. <laughs> I'll throw you in there now. Uh, we had Tom Gerganis on the show last week and I was hoping Tom would sing along as well so I could throw him in the mix, but he ended up doing this whole, I'm on the monster kid radio song. I was like, well, oh, that's awesome. So, <laughs> Oh, man. All right. So the classic five, I've got a deck of cards here. I'm going to pull five cards out of this deck. Each one of these has a this or that. Which movie do you prefer style question? It's not a trivia game. It's just a way to get monster kids talking about their favorite topic, monster movies. Chris, are you ready to play a round of the classic five? Oh, I'm always ready. All right. So card number one from the core deck. What two 1940s monster movies would make a great double feature? Oh, you know, I would just go Wolfman and Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. I was I was just thinking, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. That was in 1930. No, wait a minute. It came out after Wolfman. Wolfman's 40. It's never mind. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Again, numbers. Yeah. Not my strong suit today. <laughs> I just like the way they continue Larry Talbot's story in Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. You know, it's, it's, it's a solid follow through. And you know, it really gives Cheney a chance to just, just do a great acting job. Once the two of them met... 
the rest of the universal monster uh, cycle, I guess, or, or the main monster stories yeah. really became Larry Talbot's story, right? Because he's constantly trying to find a way to get cured of this thing. And I love that Frankenstein meets a Wolfman set that up so beautifully and carried on the story so well from the first film with uh, the gypsy mm-hmm. woman uh, and, you know, with Maleva and having her show up and all that. And it would have been nice if, if they had left the monster's character alone, you know, instead of taking away the fact that he's blind, taking away the fact that Igor's brains inside him, you know, cause that would have continued from the Frankenstein series too. And it would have been really nice to have that there, but instead, yeah, instead they really, they really yeah. kind of muck yeah. things up. I was watching, I watch a lot of YouTube these days and some channel, I forget who it was, was doing this whole you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe, whatever. Kevin Smith made the very first Cinematic what? Universe. I'm like, no, he did. What? And it's talking about like the clerk stuff, the viewers universe and all that. And I'm thinking, all right, kid, let me, let me tell you. Something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, I think Universal was doing it first. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. All right, card number two, Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing? Oh. I want to watch Chris oh, 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 oh. squirm. Oh, oh, no, you're coming, because I'm just <laughs> like, oh, no. I hate this one. You know, okay, here's the thing. It's going to vary depending on what movie, who I saw last, most recently. Oh, shoot. The one I saw most recently was the Satanic Rites of Dracula, which has them both, so I can't do that. I'm, uh-huh. Um, okay, I'm going to throw you a lifeline because I'm going to answer it, even though I said I refuse. So it's, it's, I'm always on Team Cushing, no matter what. Um, and, you know, I mean, I got to go with Cushing, too. I mean, he's just so good in everything. And yeah. I just finished a couple of weeks ago his, his um, autobiography. Oh, Yeah. Which was really interesting. Like what? What's it? It's his memoir or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a collect. It, he did it memoir, and then one that was supposed to have more about his time at Hammer, but mm. really didn't. <laughs> you know, he he kind of glossed over some of that stuff. But it was really interesting. This I find really cool. His first appearance on stage was like a background character. I'm talking about stage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's just supposed to be standing in the background, and yet he's doing something with gum that just draws attention away from the main actor to him. He was always doing that, though, man. Hot hands cushing, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's just really cool. And, you know, of course, the person was like, you don't do that when you're a background actor. Oh, sorry. Uh, but it's just interesting that he's always done that. From his first time on stage, apparently. That's awesome. That was. So, yeah, I'll go with Cushion, roundabout way of getting there. Nice. Nice. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's do this one. What was the most recent Universal Monster movie you've watched? Oh, um, oh, oh, um, Black Friday, I think, was the name of it. Uh, Karloff and Lugosi. Very little, very little Lugosi. Newspapers and magazines everywhere carried an amazing story. Reporters saw Dr. Manley Hall hypnotize actor Lugosi to give reality to a scene in Black Friday. Horror struck, they witnessed the hypnotized actor's mortal agony as Lugosi actually experienced the terror of suffocating to death in a closet. Let me out, please! I'm suffocating! sinister hand of science dares a new and dangerous experiment. Into the body of a gentle scholar is grafted the brain of a criminal, and a new and deadly monster is born to ravage an unsuspecting world. Big shot. Yeah, fix it up, will you? How'd you get it? The copper shot me. It's only a scratch. How'd you get it? Well, don't ride me. It's your fault anyway. Fine. Yeah. We'll take the bucks. Go ahead and shoot. You want to dive 200 feet for it? Keep him covered. I'm going through my uh, four 
four movies set with, you know, with Invisible Ray, The Black Cat, which I'm going to watch again because that's a great movie. But last night I was watching Black Friday, which I'd never seen before. Oh, really? Yeah, there's not enough Lugosi and there's not enough of the of Karloff and there's none of Karloff and Lugosi acting against each other, which is a shame. But mm -hmm. eh, it was okay movie. If you classify that, that would be it. Sure. No, I, not, I totally classify it. If not, The Invisible Ray, which was the night before. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days. I keep meaning to do it. I just haven't done it yet. And, you know, not saying anything against, you know, the Jason Voorhees fans out there. But one of these days, I'm going to do a special Friday the 13th episode where I talk about Black Friday because that movie is a Friday the 13th. It just happens on Friday the 13th. So um, I do want to do that. Hey, look at the calendar. August 13th is Friday the 13th. Oh, I've got perfect. Some time to figure it out. So that, that's a fun one. I really like that one. So yeah. it's Carlo. The science doesn't make sense, but, you know, whatever. I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to science not making sense, like in the movie we're going to be discussing soon. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Maybe maybe he actually did have it. Well, he's probably better at math than I am, so maybe he does know what he's doing in that. Pineal gland juice. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> the latest flavor from Gatorade. Oh, God. What is wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, that's better. I was thinking some sort of like weird Capri Sun package, but that's better. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, what's this card quest? Uh, card question three, number. Okay. Okay, three. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite Hammer vampire film not featuring Peter Cushing? Ooh. Hmm. Taste the Blood of Dracula. No, no, Dracula, Prince of Darkness. Ah, oh, okay. At this lonely crossroad in the Carpathian Mountains, four travelers find themselves abandoned at nightfall by a local coach driver who was afraid to go any further. There's no driver. A coach with horses that knew the way. A table laid for four. Was this kindly hospitality? Isn't your master joining us for dinner? No, sir. I'm afraid not. Is he indisposed? He's dead. Why should a dead man be interested in entertaining guests? Dracula, Prince of Darkness, King of the Vampires. For ten years, his mortal remains were cherished by his faithful servant, awaiting the opportunity and a victim to provide the life force for the reincarnation of Dracula. Okay, I do like Taste the Blood of Dracula, but Dracula, Prince of Darkness, always will hold a special place in my heart because it was the first Hammer movie I ever saw. Ah, uh, gotcha. It was on rotation on the CBS late night movie. CBS, before they had talk shows at 1130, would show movies. And that's also where they would show the Night Stalker. And Friday nights, at least once a year, every year, they would show Dracula, Prince of Darkness. That's good stuff. I forget the actor's name, but the one who plays the um, vampire hunter, the priest. Is that Andrew Kerr? He is so good in that. And then you, got, you have um, Barbara Shelley as the woman who becomes a vampire and she was really good in that too. I think it was Barbara. Sh yeah. Oh. It was Barbara yeah. Shelley. Uh, it's Helen, uh, Francis Matthews is in that. And I like him and hammer a lot. And it's a Terrence Fisher film. So yeah, I mean, it's solid stuff, man. Oh yeah. Good stuff. Uh, I, I, I like that one a lot, but I really like taste the blood of Dracula. I've got a real soft spot for that one. Uh, and I, I don't know why that one is appealing. You know, I know technically Prince of Darkness is a better made film. Um, but Taste of Blood of Dracula, there's something about it that I just am drawn to all the time. No, and, and I get that. I really enjoy it too. And I I, I don't think it's a better made film because I still think it looks, you know, Taste of Blood of Dracula looks beautiful at times. Sure. Um, I think it's it just suffers because Hammer had to get Christopher Lee to play Dracula. Last minute. Yeah. Ralph Bates was supposed to become their next Dracula, but um, who was it? Uh, whoever was distributing their films in America are like, no, 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 no. Has to have Christopher Lee as Dracula. And that was the end of that. I, I think that's where 
the movie in the second part kind of, you know, has its moments where it's not really, it doesn't really work as well as the first half, but it's still a great movie. I love it. There's just something about Dracula as like somebody who's taking vengeance on the three humans that are just despicable and have done terrible, terrible things. Oh yeah. And, 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 I, and maybe that's my like, Dracula as Dark Avenger. I don't know. There's just something about that that appeals to me a lot. You know, I mean, that was a better attempt to appeal at a younger audience. And if they had kept trying that, I think it would have been a good idea. It was much better than trying to appeal to the kids (laughs) than (laughs) Dracula AD 1972. Uh, I like that one. You know what? I don't I like, dislike any. I even like Scars of Dracula, okay? I, I like all the Dracula movies, just not as equally as the others. I don't, I can't look at them and say I, that one I don't like. But then I'm easy. <laughs> I've, I've learned over the past, what, seven, eight years? You put a monster mm-hmm. movie in front of me, you put a classic monster movie in front of me, and it's really, really hard for me to find something that I dislike. I'm always going to find something that I enjoy. And once I crack open that door just a little bit, Man, I'm loving it. Manos the Hands of Fate. Man, I'm loving it. Scars of Dracula. I'm loving it. You know, some of these movies I know they have kind of a bad rep. The Creeping Terror. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I know I kind of, you know, groused about it on the show, but I really do love that movie. There there is some great stuff in that. And, you know, like uh, when we were at the uh, Lovecraft Film Festival on that panel and Dominique brought up the fact that, well, you know, Creeping Terror does have some Lovecraftian moments. And it's like, you know, you're right. Where you expect that to come from, I have no idea, but it's there. Yep. I mean, and she pointed it out, and it's like, you know, you're right. I think there were a couple of people on the panel that were just kind of like, really? But it's in there. She's right. Well, and I know I made a big to-do about it and all that, but, I mean, I think I was just kind of playing up the character of, you know, Grumpy Derek at that point. Anyway, <laughs> card, let's do let's card, card number four. Uh, what kaiju suit do you wish you could try on for a day? King Ghidorah, because that's my favorite kaiju. Okay. That would be kind of cool. Be on the wires, flying around, having three heads rolling oh, around. Yeah. If they're going to wire me up, okay, that changes my answer. <laughs> well, if I'm in King Ghidorah's outfit, I want to be wired up and flying. Okay. Okay. Because I was thinking something like, you know, it'd be cool to dress up as like Jet Jaguar, even though he's not technically a kaiju or whatever. But if they're going to wire me up, man, I'm Rodan. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> If not wired up, um, you know, it'd be kind of cool to be one of the gargantuas. Interesting. Yeah. I like that movie. Oh, yeah. It's a good film. Yeah. And the ending, you know, pretty, pretty solid uh, kaiju action. Although, you know, the um, Deus Ex Volcano coming out of nowhere is kind of <laughs> silly, but. <laughs> Deus Ex Volcano. <laughs> That's good. (laughs) All right. Final card. Not counting the original. What's your favorite Hammer Frankenstein film? Not counting the original. You know, I I saw it for the first time recently because it was on Amazon. Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. Dr. Frankenstein, maker of monsters, creates the most monstrous nightmare of all. Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. From Paramount Pictures. Rated R. Under 17. Not admitted without parent. I've really warmed up to that one. I always liked it, but I, it's really started to climb up the list for me. Yeah. Peter Cushing is fantastic. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Of course. Yeah. So. yeah. But, but, I mean, he really... It's the perfect send-off for Dr. Frankenstein, for Cushing's Frankenstein. He almost gets it right, but it's like, well, we'll try again later. <laughs> he comes back and without even trying too hard, he reclaims the role. Because in the previous Hammer film that did Frankenstein was, uh, what, the horror Frankenstein where they're trying to reboot it or re- redo, it, redo it with a different cast? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they return to the Cushing Frankenstein story with quote-unquote story, even though there's really no real continuity, uh, except for the first two films. Um, well, and also he his hands are burnt, like yeah. in the last Cushing Frankenstein kind of implied. 
they do play that up. And the version that you saw, did you see Cushing's Frankenstein like using his teeth to hold sutures in place and things like that? Since he couldn't use his hands, I don't remember. I don't think they had it in there. I think it was the R-rated. Um, okay, I just I love that detail that that this Frankenstein is so committed to doing what he's doing that he will hold something in place with his teeth because his hands are messed up. Yeah, well, I've seen the pictures of that because yeah. I mean, it was all over like famous monsters and in, in a few books. But yeah, I'd like to get an un, uh, I'd like to get a unedited copy of that movie. I would. It's a good one. And it's a good one to end on. All right. Yeah. So that was the classic five. The, the classic, classic five. five. And that's where I'm going to put you in the mix. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> so we are here in week three of Lucha de Mayo. I said it right again, suckers. Ha! ha. Um, <laughs> Lucha de Mayo, where we celebrate luchador monster movies every month of May here on Monster Kid Radio. And this time around, we're doing something that I originally didn't even consider part of the luchador monster movie I guess, movement or subgenre or whatever you want to call it. But it's got wrestling in it. It's got a monster in it. It's my show. I want to do the <laughs> Batwoman from 19, what, 66? Is that right? 68. 68. 68. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 1968. And, you know, it, it does kind of count. There is a wrestling scene or two. Oh, yeah. There's each match in it. There, there is a match. There are some scenes at the gym where they're kind of sparring with each other. Uh, mm-hmm. the, other thing, the, other, the other thing this movie has that I have not seen in any of the other Luchador movies that I've seen so far for Lucha de Mayo is blatant trademark infringement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. You're not kidding there. This will never get, you know, like I said, this will never get a proper American release because whatever company is going to try and put it out, DC's lawyers are going to be going, hey, um, we want a word. <laughs> a DC and uh, Warner Brothers, I mean. Warner Brothers, yeah. The company, you know, unless Warner Brothers is the one that puts it out. And I don't know who has the rights to this film right now. I, I think it's still available on DVD here in the States. But I don't know if it's, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know who, what the situation is with it. Yeah, I don't know. But boy, I mean, they are blatant. Not only the title, but they've got that woman basically wearing an Adam West Batman mask. Yeah, it's not just DC Comics. It is the Adam West Batman series. It is that headpiece. You don't have the mask as detailed as what you see in the Adam West series. And when she's running around doing her thing out in the field, she's wearing a bikini, which is fine. I mean, we never saw Adam West in that, but whatever. When she's wrestling, though, she's wearing a bodysuit that is pretty much color blocked the exact same way Adam West's costume is as Batman. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The only thing she did, she doesn't have on that is a, uh, is the bat emblem, which actually makes that suit seem really weird looking to me. Like something was missing when I was watching her in the ring. Oh yeah. It's like this, this doesn't feel right. And I think maybe it was because it was missing the bat symbol. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's basically Batman's costume and they did have a body suit that looks like Batman. But I guess it must be hot outside, and that way, that's why she's in a bikini all the time? I don't know. I, I couldn't even answer that one. Um, you know, I'll be honest. Red-blooded American male, I appreciated it. But well, it, yeah. it, it does go back to the whole chain male bikini phenomenon where, you know, you take your women characters out there fighting crime or slaying dragons, and you put them in as little clothes as possible, which... I get the whole wish fulfillment and, you know, whatever dudes are making the movies, but it makes no sense when you stop to think about it for 30 seconds. There's a lot in this movie that doesn't make sense if you stop and think no, about this is it. No, this is the worst transgression right here. No. <laughs> <laughs> no Everything else is fine. It all checks out. I ran the science and numbers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, but so her name's Batwoman. Mm-hmm. She is literally a rich upper class woman who is like a social elite kind of person like Bruce Wayne, just she's a woman and she puts on the Batwoman outfit to go diving and fight crime and wrestle and wrestle. Yep. Yeah. And, and there's two people out there who know her secret identity mm-hmm. uh, and nobody else knows who she is, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much the setup. I, I, 
think it's nice and quick and simple and to the point. And we spend maybe a little too long doing this kind of, we're going to watch Batwoman in action scenes. And I mentioned this diving thing. Oh, there's like, God, that, it feels like there's on for like five minutes. I know it doesn't. Yeah. That was, long. that was just, yeah. I mean, I got the idea of her shooting a gun. I got the idea of her riding a horse and quick drawing, but then how long is she going to be swimming? She's doing this deep dive without an air tank. Yes. And she's got a spear gun. I'm thinking, okay, we're going to see her like shoot another target or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> because no, she, up until that point, we see a couple of target shooting scenes. Yeah. And then she just goes into a cave and that's it. It's like, well, I was expecting at least a shark or something, you know? Yeah. Nope. And so, it does seem to go on for a while, but that's okay. Whatever. You do you. That's okay. Give us give us more of her. Uh, her being... Maro Monti. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but yeah, um, I, I would, I would be sure I would mispronounce it too. Really, I wanted to find as much as I could about her because she was born in Italy. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's some of the actors who, you know, like they were born in Cuba and they had to flee because of the political situation there at times. What made her go? But uh, the only thing I could find is a Spanish Wikipedia page, and I my. Yeah, I can't read Spanish. I'm not, I wasn't even going to try. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and listen to it. It was almost five years ago now. Mm-hmm. Uh, during Lucha de Mayo 2000. Oh, that wasn't even Lucha de Mayo, was it? I was just. A, I don't know if that was Lucha de Mayo, just a regular episode. But uh, episode 270, Ken and I talked about the movie Santo versus the Martian Invaders. And, or Invasion, excuse me. And she's in right. that. Mm-hmm. So I, I wonder if we talked about it then. I'd have to go back and re-listen. Hmm. Um, but you know, she's done a couple of genre things. She did this, uh, you know, Martian invasion film. She was in a blue demon film later. Mm-hmm. I think her last, let me see. It wasn't her last film. Yeah. Yeah. Her yeah. last film was alien terror with Boris Karloff. I was say, that's a notorious one. That's one of Boris Karloff's Mexican movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where, yeah. Which I've shown on the stream. In fact, I've shown it at the monster kid movie club. Oh shoot. I missed yeah. it. Yeah, uh, it's it's not bad, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, but she did a movie with Santo. She did a movie with Blue Demon. She did a movie with Mel Mascaris with The Vampires or Lost Vampires. Mm-hmm. And that also had uh, David Carradine in it, if I remember right. John Carradine. John Carradine. David Carradine would be it, interesting, but... That would be, but yeah. <laughs> wrong guy. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, which is one that I really want to talk about here on the show at some point. Mm-hmm. But she, did, she did a handful of movies. She was also in a movie called Planet of the Female Invaders, which I think I've also shown in the Monster Kid Movie Club before. Mm-hmm. So she did a lot in a very short period of time. Her yeah. career didn't last very long. Uh, well, mid 60s to early 70s. And that's about it. Yeah, very early 70s. And um, yeah, her last credit was um, 71. So yeah, it didn't last long at all. But she did quite a few. I actually liked her a lot. I think she puts off this kind of vibe of, yeah, she's, she's rich. She knows she's well off. She doesn't have to work for a living, quote unquote. Instead, she spends her time doing, well, Batwoman stuff and, and just this kind of clean, wholesome kind of crime fighter type. And I really appreciated that. They just, I felt good hanging out with her. You know, I mean, she's a wrestler. She's called in by one of the guys who knows her identity, an FBI agent. I think that was uh, Tony. Mm-hmm. She's brought to Mexico because there have been luchadors found floating in the bay, dead obviously, um, with pineal juice, as they call it, extracted from their brain. <laughs> Surgically. It, it, they make a big point about how it's obviously somebody with surgical skills that's doing this. They even put x-rays up to show us and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, it is very specific. Somebody is surgically drilling into their heads and extracting the pineal gland juice. And I'm going to call it that from now on, even though it makes me feel a little icky. It's gland juice that they're taking. <laughs> well, okay, sure, whatever. Um. <laughs> now, I'm not a big fan of just like reading the internet movie database to people on the podcast. People can look this up for themselves. But I love the description on the IMDb about this movie. And this is pretty much all that you need to say about what this film's about. Mm -hmm. This is the one sentence synopsis for the Batwoman. Batwoman is called to investigate a whacked out scientist that is capturing wrestlers and using their spinal fluid to create a gill man. I'm in. (laughs) How can you not be? I'm so in. Yeah. Um, (laughs) What, What more do you need? Nothing. Especially when you start 
watching how he's creating the kill man. Oh my God. Oh, I felt so bad for the fish. I know. Oh. I, I, I don't. I don't get it. I don't, I, I don't get it. Because, you know, they have this fish and he brings in this. I, it's basically like a Ken doll. Yeah. And he drops in the tank with the fish and hits a bunch of bubbles. So you're watching the Ken doll sort of through the bubbles going all over the tank. And I'm sure it's beating the hell out of the fish. <laughs> felt so bad. Yeah. I don't know what's, I, I don't get it, but, um, it's science. science. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's, that's all it is. It's science. Now, as is the case with a lot of these luchadora movies that we watch, you know, like Aztec Woman versus the Mummy or Doctor of Doom or anything like that, the, the main characters, the, the wrestling women, are cast from actresses, and then they'll usually put a stunt person in the ring to do the actual wrestling. Mm-hmm. As opposed to with the other films, with the men, it's wrestler first is what they cast because that's just what they do. With the women, they do it this other way around, and they did that here too. The one wrestling match that we see, there's only one, isn't there? Yeah, well, I mean, there's where they're working out, and that's obviously yeah. um, the actress, Mora. Right. Mora, uh, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce names. I really apologize. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's Italian um, or Spanish, and I, I can't roll my R's either way, and I don't know how it's pronounced, so. Oh, uh, don't ask me to. Yeah. Um, and that's where she's actually. It's her. It's her. But there's a scene early on. That's a, is, is it a wrestling match or a practice match where it's obviously a stunt woman. And then there's the staged tag team room, mm-hmm. uh, match. That is obviously a stunt woman. And, you know, I mean, it's, ju- you can just tell this, you know, she's not built to get thrown around a ring. The actress. I mean, she could probably train and get there, but it's obvious her stunt double's a little more muscular. She is built like a wrestler if the only thing you know about women's wrestling is what Vince McMahon gives you. Okay. That, you know, that and, makes and, sense. And I don't, you know, I mean, and, and some of those women are tough, don't get me wrong, but she she is built like a model, like an actress, as opposed to the, and we're talking in grand stereotypes here. We're not judging or body shaming or anything. This is, we're talking stereotypes here. The stereotypical wrestling woman would not look like this. Well, and what I'm saying is you can tell the stunt person is a different body type. Body type. And she's, you can tell she's more muscular. And she also, you know, I mean, is able to throw herself across a ring or get thrown across a ring and come up right away. So she's been do- obviously been doing this for a while. I mean, and I've talked about this on the show. I'm a big pro wrestling fan. I watch a lot of pro wrestling. It's a lot of indie stuff as well, independent pro wrestling. And while I've never been in a ring and there's no way you'd ever get me in a ring, um, that hurts. And that's real. That's a hard throwing yourself against the ropes. That leaves marks. That leaves bruises. That's, mm-hmm. you know, and you're not going to do that to a woman who's the lead in the film, who's wearing enough fabric to maybe make half of one of my shirts, you know, because you're going to see the marks. You're going to see the bruises. You're going to see the ring wear and all that stuff. And, you know, it's clearly a different person in those yeah. suits. So there's that too. And now I get that, it. It's just one of those conceits, though, that you have to accept with these movies, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And now that being said, um, she does get involved in a fight with the fish man on the beach. And it's obviously the actress. And she's obviously hit by one of the one of the fish guy's paw. Sure, yeah. There are, there are some stunts, some stage fighting choreography. The stunts that she does, she doesn't do a bad job. It doesn't take you out of it at all. I never felt no. like, oh, well, that's fake. You yeah, know? no, she's taken on like a bunch of guys on the, on, did you notice the name of the boat? I did. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I, I, Do we want to, yeah, we'll say it's the Reptilicus. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she's taking on um, the doctor's goons on the deck of the Reptilicus and she is really doing a pretty good job. The stuntmen take all the wear and tear because, you know, they, they let her throw them, but she's convincing. 
it's all choreographed and it's well done. I mean, it didn't have the same kind of dynamic biff, pow, crunch that you get with like the Adam West Batman stuff. But I yeah. wonder now if I could, you know, in all my free time, take some of those fight scenes, run them through my editing program and, you know, add, you know, kind of can't the angle a little bit and add some of the sound effects and all that. That might be kind of funny to do. Yeah, well, that would be fun, especially if you can add the word exactly. that flash on the screen, zap, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I have absolutely nothing else to do with my nothing time, else that's to what do. I do. Nothing yeah. to do. So, like, when I'm 95 years old, and uh, <laughs> who am I kidding? <laughs> I'll still be wanting to do stuff when I'm, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I will, too. We should talk about their Fishman suit, which is really solid. I really liked it. I was so shocked. Okay, this was a first time view for me. Uh huh. You brought it up to me when we were having coffee the other day, and I was like, okay, let's do it. And you mentioned this fish suit, and then I read the thing about the Gill Man. I had never seen this before. I've never seen this movie, and I've never seen this suit design. I loved it. I thought it looked really cool. I think the eyes look a little sleeve stacky from, you know, Land of the Lost, but other than that. But the sleeve stack is cool. <laughs> that is. It works well. And I love how they hid the actor's air tank. Yes. That big, hard shell, multi finned. Yeah. The rope. hard fin in the back. Yeah. yeah. It was a brilliant idea. They did a good job. And I got to say, the underwater photography in there is beautiful. It looked really good for a movie like this. I did not expect that. You know, there's a couple of scenes where it's a little dark, but they're, for the most part, when they're underwater, they're in really clear water. There's fish swimming around everywhere. Um, you know, there's a school of, uh, I don't know, minnow like fish that keep showing up in the scene, which is really cool because it just makes it look even more impressive. It's really neat. And I'm going to put this up there. I, I've often thought about doing, here's another thing that I might do video wise. I've thought about doing like a top 10 YouTube video kind of thing for the monster kid radio YouTube channel of like my top 10 underwater monsters that aren't the gill man or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, and I would put this up there yeah, because it looks really good. Now destination inner space is monster be number one, but this monster is right up there high on the list for me. Cause it just looks cool. It's a good monster suit. It's kind of funny. When he's on land, he's got oversized flipper feet, and there's a scene where he has to go up and down a stairway, and you can tell the actor, the uh, <laughs> actor in the costume is like, "Okay, I think I got you." You can just see he's like, "I'm gonna fall here if I'm not careful." Which you know, I noticed that too, but it just felt like a guy a fish out of water. It just felt like, uh, <laughs> it just felt like it, it worked for me. This movie has a, a comic book styling and sense to it. Oh and yeah. I'm sure that was intentional because they are clearly taking inspiration. I put in air quotes from uh, Adam West Batman, but wow. Um, just the way he's kind of trying to get himself up the stairs without falling all over himself. It's great. I loved it. I thought it was great. I really did. And it works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another character in here that I also, well, okay, I actually like them all. But somebody else who really stood out to me and somebody that I really enjoyed was Igor. Oh, yeah. Uh, Carlos Suarez. And I think I did say that one correctly, unless mm -hmm. there's a rolled R in there. And again, I screwed it up. Anyway, Igor is fun. Uh, he's not the sniveling kind of like guy you don't want to. I take a lunch break with Igor. Yeah. You know, he, he's a little like, uh, you know, slimy sometimes. And yeah, he does kind of torture the fish man a little bit. Mm -hmm. I guess that's just something all assistants are supposed to do to their monsters. Oh, I think so. So the actor, he's been in a lot of yeah. luchador movies. I mean, he was he was in um, what? Santo and the Blue Demon versus Dracula and the Wolfman. One of my faves. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. He's he's been in a lot of them. And I can tell why, because he's just really good. Yeah. In that role. He's really good in that role. Uh, I really enjoyed him. And the mad scientist, Dr. Williams. Uh, Roberto, and I know I said that wrong, Roberto Canido. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm going to yeah. stop trying to say the names because I'm just making it worse. Yeah. Dr. Williams is fantastic as well. I love that he starts out already a little on the offside, you know, because he's trying to do this stuff with the pineal gland juice, which I can't say without chuckling. Uh, <laughs> But then there's a fight and he gets like 
is it an acid splash on his face? Something burns half of his face. Yeah, I think it was acid. I mean, that's so, the only thing I could think. So now we've got Batwoman versus Two Face, and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> God, good, good call on that. No, he doesn't act like Two Face, but like the makeup is. And if yeah. that was intentional, that tells us that the people who made this movie didn't just look at the Adam West series. They actually read DC comics. Cause two face doesn't appear in the Adam West series. No, no, he doesn't. So that tells us they knew exactly what they were doing. If that was intentional, hard to tell. I will say the actor who plays Dr. Williams mm-hmm. his on his IMDB page. He has one of the greatest film titles out of all the actors who are, who are on this that I scroll through. Oh, you got to tell me you got, you can't leave me hanging like this, man. What do you got? El Ninja Mexicano. I need to see this film. I know. And it's exactly what it says. Oh, oh. did you read the title? Did you read the subscription or the, the, the synopsis? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm all excited. Basic, basic, right now. Oh. Basically, it's a bunch of ninjas come in to Mexico and are doing evil and they're thwarted by a Mexican ninja. A gang of ninjas steal a chemical formula to produce a new drug. Only the Mexican ninja can stop them. That's it. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> I saw that and I'm like, this can't. Oh, it is real. Thank God. And oh, because oh. the world is better with that movie out there. And is it German or Herman Robles is in it? And he uh, was a, like, he's El Vampiro, you know, from those films. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, Chris, this is not something appropriate for MKR, but we have to watch this movie together. Oh, God. Yeah. I, I got to f- find this film. Oh, when you do, let me know, because, oh, God, that Man, just... I'm fully vaccinated as of today. You've got about a week to go, you said? No, I get I, I get my second shot um, this coming Monday, so it'll be, uh, like, around Memorial Day where it, it's set. All right, movie night coming up. We're going to watch okay. The Mexican Ninja. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I'm so there. Uh, I am so there. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that title. It was just like, oh, my... Oh, Wow. See, this is one of the things, oh boy, we are all over the place, but this is one of the things that I love about looking at the internet movie database sometimes for these episodes. Like I said, I don't like to just go through the credit list and blah, 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 you know, just whatever. Anybody can do that. Yeah. But we, we dig a little deeper and we stumble across things. I don't know what it looks like on your side. I don't know if it's personalized to me in the internet movie database just knows me more well than I'd like. But if you scroll down, you get to the more like this section. Oh, yeah. And I've got the first three movies never heard of. Uh, Well, all of them I've never heard of. But one of them is Dr. Satan y la Magia Negra. Oh, really? So I have to look this up and see what it's about. And the synopsis for this in the hell, not in hell, in the hell. The hell. The King Demon orders Dr. Satan to return to Earth to destroy Ye Lin, a powerful wizard of black magic and steal the formula that transforms all metals into gold in order to become the master of the world. Okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. I I want to break this down just a little bit, because in the hell, the King Demon... Okay, K is capitalized in the name King Demon. That's it. Yes. Yelin is a powerful wizard of black magic. The W is capitalized. That's it. (laughs) That's it. I don't know if this is just somebody's really bad attempt at translating Spanish to English or what, but I want to see this movie now, too. And apparently it was a TV movie. Oh, my God. The rating is TV PG, whatever that means. I don't know. I don't care. I need to see this movie. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm right there with you. Man, there are you so know many what? Restrictions are lifted. Vaccinations go through. We're having ourselves a Mexican monster movie night. A Mexican movie night. We're going to watch this. We're going to watch Mexican Ninja. Oh, gosh, yes. We'll order some cheap tacos. <laughs> we're, we're, Perfect. Man, it's awesome. A nachos and nacho movie, uh, movie marathon is what we'll do. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, man. Listeners, was, are you enjoying yeah. this conversation? I feel like we're all over the place, and it's because Chris is one of my dearest friends, and I'm just blah. <laughs> yeah, we just, we, oh, gosh, we ramble. This is almost like recording us in a coffee shop. Which I think we've you did done. Once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that Chris and I actually just spent some time together. We had some socially distant coffee with each other less than a week ago, which is when he brought up Batwoman. And I feel like we're just continuing our conversation and the socialization we did there uh, with this. Yep, so, pretty much. so bring it back to the film. There's something else about this movie that I 
loved. Can you guess what that is? Oh, it's got to be the soundtrack. Oh, the music is awesome. Oh, I like the theme. Oh, God, I mean, it's great. it sounds, you think it doesn't really fit, but it sounds as, as upbeat and peppy as the Batman theme. And you know what? I don't care. I'm playing some of that music right now. I love it. I love it so much. (laughs) It's this weird jazz lounge stuff. Leo Acosta is the composer Mm -hmm. of the jazz music from the film. I don't know if he did this particular piece or not, but I love the music in this from beginning to end. The only thing that I didn't like about the music is that there wasn't enough of it at the end of the movie. I felt like some of the music kind of fell off. But the rest of it, I I love the music in this. This is one of my favorite scores from any of the movies we've talked about during Lucha de Mayo. The only bit of the soundtrack I didn't like is when the Fishman, I don't want to say Gilman because, you know, that's the universal thing, but where the Fishman is coming into um, Batwoman's apartment, condo, whatever, and it's like they do a few notes and then a foghorn goes off. And they do a few notes and, uh, you know, the, you know, yeah. the bit I'm talking about, I guess they were trying to be creepy because, you know, it's coming. That is the only part of the music I was not a fan of. Everything else was perfect. I didn't have the same hang up, but I mean, you know, music, music, face are subjective and all that. Sometimes you like something and sometimes you're wrong. So, you know, that's. <laughs> I caught that. <laughs> 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 no, I, I understand what you're saying. It does it does kind of slow down. I think I would have liked something a little bit more, I don't know, not traditionally creepy, but I just, I liked the difference of it, but I hear yeah. what you're saying to her. See what, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And it would have been fine if it had been like a deep note on like a mm. bass or something. And I'm not talking to bass guitar. I'm talking, you know, <laughs> orchestral bass, you know. This bass riff kicks in when the fish monster shows up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just a single note on like that would have worked. But it just sounded, yeah, it did. It did that didn't work for me. But other than that, yeah, you're right. The soundtrack's great. The script was written by Alfredo Salazar. Alfredo Salazar, yeah, he's done a lot of genre stuff. Yeah, and then uh, Rene Cardona was the director, and you know, he's the one who got us, who brought Santa Claus and the Devil together. <laughs> uh, Rene Cardona is somebody that we've talked about a lot here during Lucha de Mayo because he was responsible for so many of those movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, I think he even did the one that we talked about last week with Tom Greganis with the Invasion of the Dead with uh, Blue Demon and uh, the amazing Professor Zovek. So this is a guy who knows his way around wrestlers. <laughs> yes. Um, and it shows. Yeah. It shows. I mean, you just look at his, look at his filmography. And mm-hmm. ooh, what is She Wolves of the Ring? That sounds like something we need to see too. See, yeah, here we no go kidding. again. Here we go. Oh, Lorena Velasquez is in that. Okay, you know what? Add that to the list. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he's the one that did the Santa Claus Mexican movie with Santa Claus and the Devil and Merlin and all those others. Yeah, and you know, <gasps> Lupe, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he's got a lot of Santo movies there. He's he, you know, yeah, he knew his way around. Luchador movies. Yeah. He's good at staging this stuff. He's good at figuring out how to make it work. His direction was great. The underwater, you know, like I said, the underwater stuff is beautiful. Yeah, it's definitely worth a watch. His last film listed here on the IMDb, the Internet Movie Database, is a movie called Las Computadoras. Which makes me think about computers, right? And, you know, lost computer doors. You pull it up and the cover image is three very sexy women, one wearing very little clothing. What kind of computer is that? I got to look this up here. Of course you do. Yes, lost (laughs) computer doors. Hang on. Here we go. What the heck? That does not compute. No. I'm sure it doesn't mean computers at this point, but yeah. Wow. That's different. <laughs> oh, my. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but look at those titles, man. Look at this stuff. Maybe know. they're maybe they're hackers that wear bikinis like Batwoman. There you go. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
you know, I, I want to know more about the suit, about the Fishman suit. And the the only uh-huh. credit that I can find attributed to that is a person in the art department of this film, Alfonso Barsanis, or Bar- Barsanis. And mm-hmm. I don't know much about him either. It doesn't seem to be a lot about him. Uh, he has this movie and two other movies listed under his name. Uh, the other two movies were things that he did like camera and electrical work on. This is the only art department credit he's got. I would love to know more about this guy yeah. because I love this suit design. It looks really cool. Yeah, the suit design is yeah. incredible. I mean, it's 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 beautiful. I don't know what else to say about this movie other than, and I mean, I've talked on the podcast and on the stream about some of the personal stuff I'm going through right now. Having this movie in my life gave me however many minutes the movie is of joy that I desperately needed. Uh, <laughs> this is an hour 20, so I had 80 minutes of just joy. I was enraptured by the Batwoman. I don't know if I'm painting it too thick. I don't know if I was just in the right frame of mind, but this movie touched me in a way (laughs) that I have not been touched in a long time. I love all the movies we talk about here on the show in one way or the other. We talked about this at the beginning of the show, but there's something about this movie that was magical. And I would have watched a 20 film series of this stuff. When I first saw it, I saw it without subtitles. You know, it was a, what is it, VCI um, DVD? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they've done some other luchador movies, th- this company, and all they do is they put the movie on DVD. They don't subtitle it. They don't dub it. It's just there. But it was, I still, even though, you know, you don't always get all the plot developments, there's not much of a plot to be developed. Yeah. You already know what's going on. Yep. You can just let this rip, although... Can we say where you can see it subtitled? Those of you who know where to get movies kind of on the down low, gray market, black market stuff, you already know. But I'm going to tell people here with this one, there is a copy of it on YouTube that has been subtitled. It's probably a fan job, which happens a lot with a lot of these movies. In this particular case, I'm okay with mentioning it. Of course, an official copy came out from whoever owns the film. I would put it on my Amazon wish list immediately. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just it's so silly. It's fun. Oh, I loved it so much. <laughs> I, yeah, I, you know, I loved this movie and I needed it badly <laughs> at the time that I watched it, and it gave me everything that I wanted and more. When I saw it, it was like this is going to be really poorly acted. The music's not going to be good. The effects are going to be bleh. And it's not. The acting is good. Everybody acting in this movie is firing on all cylinders. Yep. Um, the Agreed. photography is great. Mm-hmm. The fight choreography. The fact that the bad guys let Batwoman check her um, makeup in a little mirror and it turns out to be a small pistol. That what was, was that? The, the bad guys are so dumb. What are you doing? I know. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, it's like, well, it's fine. She's just checking her makeup for the for the bad doctor. And then all of a sudden, no, it's a pistol. I was like, what the? Oh, that's Which was great. great. I mean, that was fantastic. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I love that when she's like, you know, I'm going to go investigate the boat. I'm going to see if the doctor's on there. I mean, we're going to see if he's on the Reptilicus. And she just drives, well, not drives, but I guess pilots her little boat up to the Reptilicus. I'm here to see the doctor. <laughs> he's not seeing anybody. Well, tell him it's me. No. Okay. And then she turns around and then that confirms for her that he's there. Apparently I I just (laughs) tell him I'm here. They don't even know who you are, Yeah. but okay. We're not going to waste time with that because we got a movie to go to. We got some, we got some action scenes to film. Right. Right. (laughs) And she did that out of costume. She was not in her Batwoman guys at that point. So I guess that was her, her sneaking around, you know, trying to, I don't know. I don't care. I loved it. (laughs) (laughs) It is silly, but it's fun. It is It's, so it's fun. enjoyable. Oh. You're not going to be bored. No. And if you are, you're watching the wrong movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I know that sometimes I lay it on. Like I said, I know I lay it on thick. I know I do. I've been called <laughs> on my love of Manos. Even back when I was doing Mail Order Zombie, sometimes I would uh, give higher praise to some movies than I probably should have just because of the mood I was in or whatever. But... This one I really needed. I am so grateful (laughs) 
that you brought it up as a movie to cover on the show because man i i love it i'm gonna put this up there with like argo man in terms of like the fun goofy kind of superhero ish type stuff um that i enjoy uh it's just a treat when i saw it the first time it was actually better than i expected mm-hmm. i mean i'm not saying this is the citizen Kane of um, luchador movies or anything oh no it is it's fine no no i, I know i know, I know. <laughs> but you know it's fun, and you're going to have a good time watching it if you just let it rip. Yeah, I guess that's the thing. Is don't go into it taking it too seriously, and let go of your sp- your uh, Batman. Uh, I don't know uh, defenses or or whatever. I mm-hmm. mean, it's it, it is what it is. It's a Batman ripoff, but man, <laughs> it's so awesome. <laughs> I can hear at least one person out there right now rolling their eyes at how much I'm going on and on and on about this movie, but Oh, well, yeah, I dig it, man. I dig it a lot. So highly, highly recommended by monster kid radio and the shadow over Portland, uh, which you can find at shadow over Portland. Blogspot.com. Yep. Again, he should be in the show. He should be in the permalinks. If not, he's in the show notes, but check out what Chris is up to throw him some support. Even when he's not talking about what's going on in the Pacific Northwest, he's still talking about monster movies. He'll still do reviews and other kind of coverage and that sort of thing. So show show him some love. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'll be getting back on it. It's just last year was, (laughs) as I'm sure everybody knows the year from hell. Yeah. I mean, not, not the hell, but hell, not the hell. Yeah. And, (laughs) All I'm doing is going, okay, yeah, oh, that got postponed again. You know, it was, uh, yeah, the site kind of fell by the wayside for a year, but I'm looking at getting it back up again. So it'll be back. It's, it's getting full again. There's, there's Mm -hmm. some, there are some uh, theaters that have already scheduled out movies. So yeah, check it out. Definitely give him some support because he's been supporting Monster Kid Radio and what we do here from the very beginning, as evidenced by the very first episode we did oh, yeah. many moons ago. Let's not let's not figure out how many moons because God, I'm gonna feel old. <laughs> well, math is hard. I don't I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for having me on. You, I love coming on and talking monsters and and. and women with you <laughs> you know what there's something i wouldn't want to have one oh okay i said at the beginning of this let's come back around to something okay there's another movie out there that you have mentioned to me is available on amazon prime it does have a luchador in it it does have a superhero that shouldn't be in it in it but it's not from mexico oh are you talking oh, which one I don't know what it's called on Amazon Prime, but it's the one with Santo, Captain America, and the evil Spider-Man. Yes. I have to see that one. I just haven't gotten to it yet. You want to watch it and do it for next week's show? Okay. (laughs) Awesome. We'll get together again here shortly to record about it for next week's episode. No, it's not a traditional luchador movie, and Frank will do a Mil Cross movie at some other point, I'm sure, but... Yeah, we'll watch that one, whatever it's called. I'll figure it out. We'll watch it. We'll come back together and uh, see if we need to rewatch Batwoman to get the taste out of our mouth. I don't know. We'll see. (laughs) Yeah, well, we'll find out. I mean, that just sounds like such a weird, weird, weird movie. But that's cool. It's Turkish, isn't it? I think it's Turkish. I think so. I'm not positive. But yeah, once I find out what it is on Amazon, I'm going to be looking it up (laughs) because I got to. Yeah, that's one that I have to see means that you and I are going to have to record again within the next week. You down with that? That's no problem. You you know my schedule. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, listeners, I did a lot of checking. Chris and I actually spent a little bit more time online together trying to find that movie that we were talking about, the Santo and Captain America and Evil Superman, or I guess Evil Spider-Man, or whatever it is. I haven't seen the movie yet. I just kind of know it by reputation. Anyway, it's no longer on Amazon Prime, but it's on YouTube, so that's what we're going to watch. If you want to get ahead of the game, check it out on YouTube. It's under the title, the number three... Dev, so D-E-V, and then the last word is Adam, A-D-A-M. So the number three, separate word Dev, separate word Adam. I don't know what it stands for. I don't speak or read Turkish, 
but this YouTube video, this YouTube version is subtitled, so at least I'll know what the heck they're saying in this movie. I can't wait to talk about it next week with Chris. I had so much fun catching up with Chris uh, before we started recording and just chatting with him about this week's movie, Batwoman. I'm still riding pretty high. You know, I'm editing this Wednesday night, and I'm still on the jazz about Batwoman. The movie was so cool. in one shock show. Horror of Frankenstein and Scars of Dracula. Your ticket entitles you to be frightened out of your wits at no extra charge. Horror of Frankenstein and Scars of Dracula. In color, rated R. Dracula is back. In the first now Dracula movie, Dracula A.D. 1972. And with this new motion picture, an unrivaled event, horror ritual. <coughs> you will participate with a Transylvanian vampire himself, swearing you in as an honorary member of the Count Dracula Society. He comes back from the living dead to extend you his personal invitation. Join me in the horror ritual. You heard it with your own ears from his blood-red lips. Get your honorary membership card when you see the new Dracula movie, Dracula A.D. 1972, and participate in the horror ritual. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. That brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. I want to thank everybody for listening, for being here, for checking out the show, downloading the show, streaming the show, listening to the show, sharing the show, retweeting shows. However it is you consume and share the episode, it's good for us. So thank you so much for helping us in that way. Now you can learn all about you need to know. Boy, my words are getting mixed up. You know, that's what happens when I wait until like midnight to start editing the episode to put out the next morning. I'm not even going to cut that. I'm still on the jazz from that movie, you know? <laughs> Maybe I should start cutting this, especially since I want to thank all of our advertisers and let people know that we do have advertising available here on this podcast as well as on the movie streams, the Monster Kid Movie Club and the Monster Kid Astronomy Club. Advertising is available. If you'd like to see a copy of the ad rate sheet, please feel free to email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com, which is also how you can get a hold of us by email if you have any feedback for the show. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at 503-810-5MKR. That's 503 810 Five six five seven, or you can send an email to the podcast. MonsterKidRadio at gmail dot com is the email address. That's MonsterKidRadio at gmail dot com. All right, where was I? Uh, let's see that contact information. You know what? It's on our website, MonsterKidRadio dot net. This is where you're going to want to go to learn everything you need to know about Monster Kid Radio between episodes. It's all right there. Everything, all the links that we've talked about, everything that is available for sale through Amazon. You're going to be able to find buttons and links and ways to get to those places on the internet. You're going to find our contact information, links to our Facebook page, our Facebook group, our Twitter, our Discord, and our Reddit. You'll also find information about how you can get to our Monster Kid Movie Club screening this Saturday, starting at 11 a.m. Pacific, which is when the pre-show is. Movies start around noon. Normally we show monster movies, but this weekend we're going to get into a different kind of darkness when we switch it up. We're going to be doing some film noir films this upcoming weekend. You don't want to miss that. It's at twitch.tv slash monster kid radio. It's a good time. It's free. There's a live chat. There's an opportunity for you to win a free monster kid radio t-shirt. It's just a lot of fun. And you know what would make it even better? if you joined us. So please head on over and join us there. And then next week on Tuesday in the Monster Kid Astronomy Club at the same place on Twitch, we're going to be showing some more installments of the Adventures of Captain Marvel and the Clutching Hand film serials. 
So you'll want to be there for that as well. If you have time, we'd love to have you. It's a lot of fun. And again, you'll make it better. Next week, well, you heard Chris and I talk about it. The movie is called Three Dev Adam. Is it a legitimate luchador movie from Mexico? Absolutely not. But Santos in it, and I'm in this weird kind of superhero knockoff kick, so we're going to watch that movie. It's the evil Spider-Man as the villain. Captain America and Santo team up to fight him. I've not seen the movie yet. Like I said, I found it on YouTube. You'll be able to find it on YouTube as well. Again, look up Three Dev Adams. And so the number three uh, new word D E V as in Victor. And then the final word is Adam A D A M. So that's coming up next week. And then I can go ahead and let you know that in the future weeks in the upcoming weeks, we're going to have Jonathan in body on to talk about the 1978 invasion of the body snatchers. We're going to have Paul McComas here to talk about King Kong on Broadway. I feel like I've got other recordings in the can too. Yeah. DB Spitzer is going to be talking about robot monster. And I'm trying to line something up with Michael Lecce to talk about, Dwight Fry here on the show. We've got a lot of really cool stuff coming up. And the only way that you're guaranteed to get your ears wrapped around that cool stuff is if you stay listening to Monster Kid Radio at monsterkidradio.net or wherever it is you download your podcasts. Until next week, remember that Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song El Santo, The Masked Avenger, which, yeah, what the heck, I'm going to play it again next week anyway. That is copyright the Nick Adams. They gave us permission to play their music here on the show back in the day, and you know I like to play this stuff during Lucha de Mayo, so... Here it is. Until next week, my name is Derek M. Cook. Adios. Buenas noches. No está mi mano. No está mi cara.